And my life coach helped me be brave enough to admit what I wanted to do with my career, with my life, how to turn my gifts of saying what everyone is thinking, but no one will say out loud into a strength. And turns out coaching is that gift. Hey everyone, it's Jen Foster here with Elite Online Publishing. I'm here on the Elite Expert Insider Podcast. Unfortunately, Melanie isn't here today, but we are going to take the reins and dive into some fun stuff. I have Stephanie Krevins here today, and she is actually with the Change Architects. So what she does is she helps people to and companies to help them to get unstuck and kind of help get out of that messy middle of change because a lot of people have growing pains and they don't want to change. Like I was just talking about earlier in the green room, we don't want to change when people tell us we have to change. It's like, well, I've been doing this for seven years. So I'm really excited to have Stephanie on today. And we're going to talk a little bit about also why meetings suck. So that's going to be really fun. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you, Jen. So excited to be here. It's an honor. Thank you. Well, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into being a change architect. Yeah. So let's tie it to why meetings suck. And that's why I'm like, I have this like personal vendetta to make meetings not suck. But, you know, my last employee situation, employer situation, love the mission, love the organization, really great people. And I signed up for a Salesforce conversion project. And this was a nonprofit with about 10 years worth of history. We were combining 10 Excel files, an access database, a fundraising database into the latest and greatest tech. And it's still Salesforce. And back then it was Salesforce. This was about 2014 or so, 2013, 2014. And the combination of cleaning all of that data by myself on a couch for months on end, you know, I was really supposed to be the business strategy person, the person training our colleagues. I had a tech resource to help us customize Salesforce, but because I was unable to advocate for myself effectively, I didn't have someone help me clean the data. And so that meant that I spent months by myself on a couch cleaning Excel data. And by by data, I mean 28 columns wide, 26,000 rows long worth of data wow. that I matched up across 10 years of organizational history managed wow. by probably 10 to 12 different people to make it all consistent and make it all get dumped and make sense into Salesforce. And so mm -hmm. I don't know if folks can pick up, but I'm a bit of an extrovert's extrovert. And so anything more than four hours on a couch by myself cleaning data is like death to my soul. So that was happening. And simultaneously, you know, we had a leadership transition and our new leader was trying to do some really great things inside of the organization. And there was some resistance, but staff meetings became completely pointless. Like I did not understand why we were sitting around a table for an hour and a half every single week. And every time she would say, what are you working on and what do you need help with? And no one ever asked for help. I was like, all we're doing is running around and folks have seen this in their organization, you know, for eons, we're running around telling ourselves and each other how busy we are and how much work we have to do. And yet here we are at a purposeful time to ask for help and no one asked for help. I mean, six months straight, no one asked for help. And I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this than like sitting around and listening to folks describe work that, you know, half the time I didn't understand what they were describing. And the other half the time it didn't relate to me, which speaks to our silos issue that we have inside of organizations. And so it broke me. It broke me bad. I was like, I can't do this. I cannot spend my meeting. life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And so I was just so frustrated. I went to go see a life coach to say, you know, like, why am I so frustrated? Why am I so angry? Why am I on my third career after grad school? And I can't seem to fit in. Like other people seem to be okay with sitting in pointless meetings. I cannot, like I cannot. And my life coach helped me be brave enough to admit what I wanted to do with my career, with my life, how to turn my gifts of saying what everyone is thinking, but no one will say out loud into a strength, into something to be valued. And mm -hmm. turns out coaching is that gift. And so a little over 10 years ago, I became a trained coach. And over the years, went from life coaching to executive coaching, to team coaching, to group coaching and training. 
And when the pandemic hit, all eyes and all resources got focused on IT because they were the heart and the soul of our businesses continuing to run. And so we began serving IT teams. And since really 2020, we have come alongside these IT teams as they need to build their change readiness skills, their communication skills, their project management skills, their leadership skills. And that has morphed into what I call the change architecture because change management is not as simple as really great communication plans or a really great strategic plan that says, this is how the business is going to grow. It is a layering effect of multiple programs inside of our organizations. And most organizations see them as kind of separate programs, right? Like we have our leadership development program over here, and we have our person that focuses on internal comms over here, and we have our project management person over here. And sometimes they come together and have really crappy meetings together, but none of it's unified. And I'm like, our leaders don't need another program. They need something that connects all the dots. And so that's the inspiration behind the change architects, the change architecture, you know, just helping leaders unify all these things that are distracting their attention every single day to add up to strategy and meetings are the foundation for driving change. And I'll come up for air because all of that good work truly happens in meetings when you get people together to do good work. That's and it. if they're not boring meetings and they're actually effective meetings, that's even better. <laughs> even better. Well, tell, even tell, better. Tell us, yes. Tell us a little bit why, I mean, well, not a little bit. I think this is a lot. <laughs> why does everyone think that change is so hard? Oh, so it, it there's a psychological component to it. You know, bottom line is that as humans, we are wired for safety and connection with other human beings first and foremost. And this has to take us all the way back to how humans evolved around a campfire, breaking bread together. Well, back then they didn't break bread. They, you know, ate some saber tooth tiger and, you know, some berries and nuts and stuff, but we survived because we stuck together. We survived because we were always watching for danger. And in the 21st century, the dangers are not the same and we don't rely on each other for our physical life in the same way, yet our limbic system still believes that we do. So anytime we feel like we're being ostracized from other human beings, anytime we feel like we're not getting all the other information, but other people are, our poor little brain, specifically our limbic system, which is the first part of our brain to evolve into modern humanness. And I'm oversimplifying here, so forgive me, but I think the essence shines through here. And anytime we feel threatened that we are going to lose our status with other human beings, our limbic brain goes, oh my gosh, we're going to die. That's why change feels hard. That's why losing autonomy feels hard. You know, most of what a lot of changes, the reason people get so upset about it is because we feel like we're losing autonomy because other people in our organization are making decisions about what our work is. And so to me, that's a self-management or self-leadership opportunity to say, I'm not, you know, my brain is reacting in fear, but Really what this is, someone else is making decisions about what my job is or isn't going to be. Now, whether or not you like it, whether or not you want to continue to participate in that role, if it is changing, that's a different choice. But bottom line is change feels hard because our limbic brain, our lizard brain hijacks our prefrontal cortex and tells us we're going to die because we perceive something has been taken away from us or we're being separated from other human beings. So- mm -hmm. In order for change to not be hard, we got to get back up into our prefrontal cortex where our thinking happens, as well as other more helpful part of our brains that helps us manage time and emotions and, and logic and feelings and all of that. But that's the simple answer to that right there. There you go. Yeah. And yeah, I think ch change sounds hard, but when you really actually do the little steps that it takes to change, it's not hard. No. And it's, you know, just to tell on myself because I'm in the middle of it too, you know, not just, I, I never pretend like I have it all figured out. So I have a newborn at home. He's four and a half months old. He's awesome. He's beautiful. And he interrupts my sleep and my emotional capacity at work right now. And we are, we've switched systems in a lot of ways. And one of the last pieces of switching is from one password management software to another that's integrated with our system. 
and I am the last holdout because my brain is going, oh my God, this is so hard because I have hundreds of passwords stored in this old system that I then need to import. I need to reshare. Yes, my EA can help me with portions of it, but there's portions of it that's not appropriate for her to do. There's a body of work for me to do. And my brain is going, oh my gosh, this is so hard. And I'm the last holdout by two months. Like yeah. not okay for me as a team player, like not okay. And I sat down to use the new system yesterday to access a password because everyone else's shared passwords are in there. And I was like, this is super easy. What have I been resisting? No, my right? emotional, yeah, my emotional mental energy is my bandwidth is low right now. And that's impacting the way I view these fairly simple mm. things. <laughs> I was laughing because I've been resisting that change as well. I'm like, oh. I know that we need to switch our password software yeah. and I know that like we're doing it wrong and I've been resisting, even though I know it even wouldn't even cost that much to hire an IT company to do it, yeah. you know? And so I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm resisting that change. But I feel you on the four and a half month old baby because when I had my babies, it's a big disruptor, especially when you're trying to work from home and do different things and yeah, it works, but it's figuring out how to apply the change for sure. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, let's talk about more about the why meetings suck. So you talked a little bit in the beginning about, you know, how it was just, you know, listening over and over again to people talk about what they're doing and it's going over your head because it's not in your wheelhouse and yep. it's boring and it's like, and you check out, right? So then it's even more boring. <laughs> like, so let's talk about how do we make meetings not suck? Oh my gosh. Especially team um, meetings where everyone's telling everyone what they're going to do, what they're doing. Or what yeah. They've been doing. Yeah. So that's a great example of how we use meetings to solve for the wrong problem. So in that particular case, you know, we all had the same manager, which was also an organizational issue. There were like 12 of us that all reported to the executive director pretty much. And we were viewed as a team. Well, a team is a group of people responsible for shared results. We were not a group of people responsible for shared results. We all had our own programs that operated in very distinct silos, rightly or wrongly, but they operated in very distinct silos, different target audiences, different coordinators that we worked with, sometimes different funding streams. I mean, the only thing that connected us was the organization as our fiduciary or as our financial mechanism, our executive director and our target audience, the churches that we worked with. It was a Christian social justice nonprofit. And we worked with certain churches across the country. So when we're listening to each other describe our work, because there was so little overlap in the actual work, there's nothing to collaborate on, you know, it just kind of becomes interesting news. So there was where we were, I believe, and the intent is always good, of course, our executive director wanted us to know more about what was going on. Our executive director wanted us to collaborate more by hearing updates, but we were using meetings to do that. That was not driving collaboration, except for maybe like our marketing folks and our fundraising folks. Of course, they're always interconnected to everything. So that's a great example of using meetings to solve the wrong problem. Another common one I see is using meetings to solve accountability problems. So you have a meeting, you talk a lot, people say they're going to do things, then there's no deadline given to it. Or you say a group of people are responsible for accomplishing something and it never gets done. So then we need to call a meeting to regroup and make sure we're all on the same page. And then you have the same conversation again. That is an accountability problem. That's not a meeting problem. So the way to solve that accountability problem is one, make sure that every meeting has a set of decisions that come out of it. They have a set of deadlines and they have one person responsible for that deadline and that piece of work or that task. Anytime we give it to a group, everyone's going to evade responsibility except for like the overachievers who always like burn themselves out to get all the work done all of the time. I'm one of those recovering ones, but it's the same thing as if you send an email to five people and no one responds because everyone's like, oh, someone else is going to respond. All right, it's taken care of. And then no one responds. Exact same concept. Yeah. And Work isn't being made visible. No one knows what else anyone else is working on. 
folks outside of the meeting are being communicated with so they don't understand what's happening in that meeting so they feel left out they accuse the organization of a lack of transparency and the work isn't getting done so to solve that problem work needs to be visible in a project management system or even on a whiteboard or even in an excel spreadsheet it doesn't matter make the work visible so colleagues can see what it is of course, unless it's confidential HR stuff, of course, but that solves that problem. And then same with communication, right? Like meetings suck because we use them to communicate. So then they become status updates when the meeting could become, could have become an email. Usually what's happening is managers aren't communicating out to their direct reports what's happening in meetings. And so those folks create a lot of noise, a lot of distraction because they're not getting the right information at the right time because in the meeting, no communication plan was set of, hey, Sarah, we need to make sure that you communicate these three things to your four direct reports by tomorrow in order for this to cascade down. Hey, Tim, make sure that you tell your EA that this is your role in it and that you know, this is a confidential situation that she can't share out, you know, whatever it is, when I use the word communication plan, it's nothing, it's nothing complicated. It's just simply, how do we take this information out of this meeting to make sure the right people know, so that we're only using the time of the right people in this meeting. So I feel like I went off course there a little bit, but (laughs) those are why that's why meetings suck and baked into there. Here's how you, here's how you fix them is you don't allow meetings to solve for the wrong problem, like accountability, like communication, like silos, you use meetings to brainstorm, to make decisions, and it can legit be a way to keep people informed, but you have to tell people, we're telling you this. Here's when you can ask questions about it. Either we want you to process it and come back tomorrow or next week, or Q&A time is baked into this meeting, but it's not really a meeting. It's a presentation with Q&A, which is different than most people's perceptions of a meeting. Yeah, I like that. We actually just went over SMART goals again in our team meeting because we were reminding ourselves that we need to have deadlines, (laughs) that we need to actually set some, you know, the whole smart goal thing and actually have actual days or times that things are due um, yes. because we're having issues with that, which is really an accountability thing, like you were saying, and really could have been dealt with in a different way, like in direct reports or in, in team reports instead of at an actual meeting. So yes. I like yes. how you're talking about presentation and brainstorming and Q&A because this type of uh, team meeting, people will be excited to be there because they can contribute, have that community and have that communication. Yes, yes. And they're excited to your point. They're excited to feel like they're participating in the work of the organization at a level that they may maybe don't get access to all the time. And so capitalize on that and don't pretend like it's something that it's not. You know, another thing that leaders tend to not do that's not very helpful is they'll give that presentation, that update, and they'll say, oh, what feedback do you have? No, do not open up that can of worms because you are going to get feedback from results to processes, to relationships, to resources. You should have already decided most of that before you came into that meeting. If it's an information sharing meeting, instead it's, you know, what concerns do you have about how fast this timeline is moving? What Mm -hmm. opportunities do you see in us reaching these goals? Mm -hmm. You want to ask very targeted feedback questions, especially using appreciative inquiry. So framing them in a very positive way. So my first example wasn't a great one, but framing it in a positive way, again, to help people frame what they're hearing in a positive way and in a way they can contribute to. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. Well, tell people where they can go to get more information about you and to hire you guys as a strategic coach. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So you can find us at thechangearchitects.com. If you're loving what you're learning through this conversation today, you know, we developed a whole masterclass for this, which is an online learning experience for employees at all levels to run better meetings because it's such a huge problem. And so if you want to check that out, we'll put the link to get a free preview of that content and you can learn more there. Main website is thechangearchitects.com and you can see that too, but you can get direct access through that link that we'll share because it's 
Meetings are the most expensive use of company time. Like if we were to sit down and do the math for what it takes to gather your people together, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And we use it. We use that time very haphazardly. And so my perspective is that meetings are an extremely expensive use of time, which must mean they must be the most valuable use of time. And those are all skills that all of us can learn. And so that's why I love to share them with folks through our master classes. Awesome. I like that. Well, we'll put the, the link up in the show notes. Appreciate uh, so it. Thank you. And learn more about you and your company. Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. If you would like to subscribe and follow, that would be great wherever you're listening to podcasts on YouTube or Spotify iTunes, follow us and leave a review and talk, tell us how you liked the episode today. We would appreciate that. And of course, as always, if you are looking to write or publish a book, or we can help you do that, we help people self-publish their books and become bestsellers. So contact us at EliteOnlinePublishing.com. Hey, are you looking to increase your revenue, build credibility, and elevate your brand? This podcast is brought to you by Elite Online Publishing, an innovative publishing and full-spectrum marketing company. They will publish and market your book to make it a number one bestseller. Becoming an author is the best way to market your business. So contact them at EliteOnlinePublishing.com today. All of their authors become number one bestsellers.